I'd rather have Jesus became Shay's theme song for audiences around the world. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We're especially reminded through this song, Lord, that we can have everything in the world and have nothing unless we have you. And boy, what a blessing it is to have you and all the blessings that you do give, both eternal and physically here on this earth. Lord, I praise you that these folks thank you, too, as they give their gifts in gratitude for what you have done for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we want to thank you for all the rich blessings you give us in our lives. We're so grateful for this country and the freedoms that we have and the ability that we have to earn a living and to do things freely and enjoy life to its fullness. We praise you for our health and we praise you for also, too, uh, the beautiful material blessings you've given to us. And as uh, we live in America today, and Lord, we pray especially for our leaders that they will uphold the democracy that we have and not use it irresponsibly and give people the freedoms that they are given by you through the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Praying by our Father from the word, Fathers from the Word of God. I pray, Father God, especially for the Congress and the Senate and also to, <clears throat> for our President and to the judicial system that they understand this very well, Lord, and they execute their abilities and legislations to the right way in which you desire for it to be done. We praise you also, Father, for those who defend us, for the military, for those on our streets every day, please fire response, Lord. I just pray that you will be with them and keep them safe. And today, Heavenly Father, we bring to you also the people that we know that are struggling. We think of Bill and Evelyn and Lucille and Karen and Kay who are stuck in their homes. We thank you, Lord, that Joyce is with us today. And 
that her procedure, that um, the diagnostic they did um, showed very good signs and that she can have her procedure this week which will uh, bring healing and hope to her. We pray also too, Lord, for those that we know that are struggling in their lives. I want to think of Larry Baumgarten and the family he has that lost him this week, a firefighter on duty who went home and collapsed dead in his home. I just pray for their family and for the firefighters who lost a wonderful friend. I pray also too for Larry and for his family as they make the adjustments and for his stepdad, Bob, who has to go into the nursing home to provide for him. I think of my cousin Nancy and her breast cancer, Lord, and be bring healing to her as she has a radical. I pray also too, Father God, for Don and his continual healing of his knee. I think too, Father God, of Howard, that he can find a house. I think also too, Lord, of some of the people that we know that are battling right now addictions for Ryan and for Jordan and David and Eric and Ricky and Mitch. These, Lord, are hung under the bondage, Lord, and that they can break free. And, Lord, we want to thank you for this time together that we have to worship you and to honor you in all our lives. I pray for the folks out here, Lord, the things that are going on in their lives that you know about, Lord. And I pray that you'll just watch over them for marriages that are struggling right now. Lord, I pray for your healing. I pray that you'll open up eyes to see what truly you want them to see. I pray also, too, for those that are struggling in areas of finance or homes or whatever, Lord, may be with troubled children. Jesus, just be with them and give them the strength that they need. And now, Heavenly Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon us. Help us to hear something in this message as I bobble these words, Lord that we need to hear from your word something that we need to do in our lives something we might need to change or that we need to be reminded of that we need whatever it is lord you know each one of our hearts and you know what we need to take into this week to honor you even better than we did last week thank you christ for this time in jesus name amen I once heard a story about a marketplace in northern India. An old farmer brought a bunch of quail that he had basically taken captive. He wanted to sell them in the market. They were tied down by little strings around their legs, but they would constantly go in a circle. And one day, he was there and a Hindu Brahmin came. He's a religious man in that culture. He said, I want to buy them all. And after he bought them, he said, now I want you to cut the strings around their legs to set them free. And so the man did it after he paid him and he cut those strings and those birds just kept on going in circles. He had to train them to go in a circle so that it would attract people to see how well they were. And the Brahmin got upset because he thought once they would cut the strings that they'd fly off, but they didn't. Then the man, the holy man, went over and tried to scare them. And they flew up in the air and they flew about 10 feet. They landed and they all got in a circle again and just kept on going around in the circle. And the Hindu man was very angry about it. Because even though he had bought them their freedom, they were still basically prisoners of their past and learning patterns. And folks, sometimes that happens with us as Christians. Even though we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord, there are certain patterns in our lives, certain things that happen in our life, and we still hold on to them. And we go back to the old safe way because they're patterns that make us feel comfort. And today, we're embarking on a new <clears throat> journey of faith through Moses in the book of Exodus. And we're going to find that not only Moses... But the people of Israel were stuck in patterns that's easy to stay in and not change. And God wants to break them so we can be free in Christ and to do things for his glory. And the book of Exodus is the second book of the Bible. 
It's called Exodus because the Greeks came along or where the writers did and they said this is a book about exiting. But the, really, the Jews hold the book as these are the names they call this book. Because that's what the first line is. But the fullness of Exodus means that there are a group of people who were leaving slavery and embarking on a whole new life. And God wanted them to become a great nation. But it was going to take a lot for them to get there. They are brought out of Egypt by the hand of the Lord, the Bible says. And I don't know if you know it or not, but Moses wrote the most of any of the writers of the Bible. Because he wrote the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We have a second in John and then Luke and then Paul. But it's interesting that this book brought to us 3,400 years ago by the writings of Moses is still what we need to hear. Why? Because the Bible says it's God's word. And it's there to correct us, there to enlighten us. To open up our minds to see who we are and to understand God. In fact, Moses wrote these to, so that the children of Israel can learn about God. That they can get to know him as their friend. The Apostle Paul says it well in 1 Corinthians 10. Where he says these things happen as examples for us. So that we don't fall into these patterns in our own life. Especially as we approach the end of time. Now, Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which is, means, Penta means five, and Tuch means scrolls. And basically, these five books are called the Pentateuch or the Torah, which is God's law to mankind. In fact, our law legal system, our jurisprudence legal system is built from what Moses started here way back 3,400 years ago. And God, has, God used him to bring that wisdom. And today we have here... This powerful book, book called the names or the book of Exodus, however you want to. And it's interesting that in each one of the books after Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all start with the word now. And really, <clears throat> the reason why it does is because these are all a continuation of one to the other. After Genesis, the continuation of the story comes in Exodus and after Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And the word, the letter in the Greek, in the Hebrew, I mean, is like a, almost like a, a, a note uh, or a, a marking in a, uh, on a, uh, uh, a um, score of music. And it looks like that, but it's got a dot in front of it. And <clears throat> the word that comes from that one little letter that is put in front of them, it's called, it, it's, it becomes an and. And that's how come we know these are continuations of of what Moses wanted us to understand. It's called the Va. And <clears throat> what this book is about though. Is how God makes himself known to his people. That's the theology. And <clears throat> it's a great understanding of our lives. And how we interact with God. And how we grow in our faith. And how important that is. And what we see in Genesis chapter 12. God called Abraham out of the Chaldees and he said to him, I'm going to take you away from your family and your friends and everything. And I'm going to bring you to make you a new nation. Israel was never a nation at this point. And God said, I'm going to make you a nation. And it's interesting how God brings that about. We're going to see that to begin with today and throughout the book of Exodus. Listen to what he says in Exodus chapter 12 to Abram. He said, Leave your native country, your relatives and your family and friends, and go to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make you famous, and I will be blessing to others, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you with contempt, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So now here we are in the book of Exodus, and God is going to show us how God brings that blessing. God promises to the children of Israel. And we're going to see how God blesses Israel 
and how it can easily become a bitterness. You know, there's a lot of things that can easily be a blessing to us and turn out to be a bitterness in our life. And here we have it. Jacob moved to Egypt with his, their, father, his, their father and each with his family. Now we have 70 people who show up in Goshen. If you remember the story of, Ex of Genesis, at the end of it, Joseph was set aside. His brothers sold him into slavery. But God had that all bad in his life happen for a purpose so that he could be the deliverer of Israel at that time. Famine had struck the whole area. And if it wasn't for Joseph and his wisdom, and it started by his brothers selling him off into slavery. And then for Joseph to go through several things before he became second in command of Egypt. And he saved not only the Egyptians, but many of the countries around him, and especially his father and brothers, the 70 who came and moved to Goshen, a very nice place outside of Egypt that was segregated from the Egyptians. And God gave him that. But over 400 years, they became slaves. And the Bible tells us how that blessing turns into bitterness in their lives. Maybe some of you know of people who've been super blessed in their life, maybe financially, and how it turned into bitterness. I was looking at TV the other night and watching the British royals, the two brothers, and the books that are written, the things are said, and all that bitterness, and amongst of all that blessing that they have. Maybe you've been part of something like that where you were very blessed by God and somebody wanted you to be miserable and wanted to take from you. I had a friend, I still have a friend in fact, saw him not too long ago, but he worked for a large corporation. And while he was working for this large corporation, he was making a lot of money as a salesman. But as he was working along his supervisor, was just making a salary. He was not making anything like my friend was. He became jealous because my friend was making quite a bit more than he was, in fact, triple about what the boss was making. And his boss became very angry and tried to put stipulations and change the structure of paying him so that he could get a little more kickback, the boss did. And my, bo my, my friend continued to sit, pray about it. And he was worried what God was doing in his life with this boss that was just being unruly. And how he was so greedy and making him. And then to top it all off, he made him move from Minnesota to Colorado. And he'd have to start all over with the new clients that he had. And so he did and started even continuing to make more money. And he said, God, what are you doing here? Well, God had a plan. And one day he was talking with a fellow that he was selling. And the fellow was telling him that he was building a new mansion. In one of these multi-million dollar mansions on the Colorado mountains. And as he was building that mansion on the Colorado, he said, my wife cannot find this specialized wood. She would like to have our cabinets made and our, our, our trim uh, made in our house. And my friend decided to do a little research on it, and he found the wood. He found a supplier who had it, and he sold it to the man. And he realized this was just not a happenstance. In fact, what he did, he gave up his job with that big corporation and started working on his own. And his stepson became his carpenter, and he was a salesman. And found all these exotic woods that people came to him to get so to make their, cabinet, their cabinets and, and, and their trim work. And it's done very well. It's little that I realize that God had a better plan for my life. You may be struggling today in your own life with something that was good and now has become a bitterness or a hurt. God can put that back together. You don't realize what God is doing right now behind the scenes. But you may feel that God has forgotten you. But sometimes God has to work 
in situations to get us to change and to be different. I know the children of the early church. You know, it's interesting that God blessed the church in its infant stage. But one of the blessings that God had said to them, and Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel. But guess what was happening? They weren't doing it. They were staying and hanging around in Jerusalem and Antioch. But God had a plan for that too. God caused persecution to come to the church. And because of that persecution, the church moved. It began to take the Bible and the, the gospel out into the world. And it all became because they were being persecuted. They had to leave Jerusalem. They had to leave Antioch and move out into the world and spread the gospel. And God did that through persecution. Sometimes God will do that in our own lives. He'll bring a great painful experience to us. A trial. A difficulty. In order to mold us and make us to the spot where he wants us to be. And that we can give glory to God. We saw it in Joseph's life in the book of Genesis. Where he was sold into slavery. And what a terrible thing. But God was all part of that. That's why he could forgive his brothers who sold him into slavery. Because he saw it in the bigger picture. And at the end when he discloses who he is. And he spares the Israelites and his father and his brothers. He can forgive him because he says. This was not you guys. You did the evil. But God had that all in his plan. So that you and I can be in the spots we're to be today. And that I can provide for you. Because what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. And so he had that. And today, we see that with the Hebrews. Here they were, blessed mightily in Joseph's era. But in the next 400 years, they came in slavery. Now, why did that happen? Well, God was going to move and mold them to get them ready to become a great nation. But they were nowhere ready for it when they were just 70 people. They were nowhere ready to deal with it because they had a very comfortable life. And God had to jar them, make their life miserable, so that they could see God's plan and be molded and be prepared as a nation. Not as just a nice group of people living off the Egyptians. He wanted to make them a nation. And a strong nation. And so here we have it. We have this new pharaoh that comes on that didn't know about Joseph. And they had just come out of the Hyksos dynasty. And the Hyksos were a bunch of shepherds that moved in in Egypt. And basically took over for a while. And here now they finally got back. Leadership by the Egyptians. And that's what this Pharaoh is. And this Pharaoh was paranoid because he afraid that the Israelite would do the same thing and take over their culture. Take over their nation. And so he had to have a plan. Look what it says. And we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. And so what does he do? So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. See, this is all part of God's plan. So to make them strong, he afflicted the adults so that they would have to go into slavery and that rather than staying in a safe and secure environment down in Goshen, now they were under this oppression. But you see, God was working in them. You realize that there's no other group of people more persecuted than ever in all of history than the Jews. And it began here. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, we see them being persecuted. We see their, them dispersed twice. We see their nation destroyed several times. And now, in back in 48, we see in America that we realize that they're back now as a nation. This all happened for God's purpose. We saw Hitler deal with his word to the Germans 
he would call it the Jewish problem, in which he was going to exterminate the Jews. And we see this Pharaoh going to keep them back by oppressing them more. And he wanted them to be faithful. You see, when we go through difficult times, God wants you and I to grow in our faithfulness to him. Not walk away, not get angry with him, but rather to walk with him by faith, to trust him through those dark hours. This is what God was beginning to teach these people. And he told them that they would be oppressed and that the world, they need to be faithful in the midst of a world that was very unkind to them. And sometimes you'll find that in your own life right now here in America. When you change the conversation or when they see the conversation and you take the Christian value system and do it, you are going to enlighten their sensibilities and they're not going to like it. They're going to say things against you because their consciences that are seared. You're saying, no, it's wrong in God's eyes. And you may be persecuted by it, but that's when we need to have the faith and be strong. Because in this culture right now, things are changing fast. In the Western world, the church, what's going to happen to the church? Will she remain faithful and stand for what is right? <clears throat> we have a world right now that needs to hear the truth. Will we stand firm? It's interesting right now. <clears throat> they're saying that <clears throat> they believe that that will happen because conservatives are having more kids than the liberals. <clears throat> and will wind up out populating them. But be that as it may, the church may be leaner. The church may be stronger, but it's going to be strong. You see, that's what God was doing with the Israelites when he put them into slavery. He wanted to make them strong people who could go into battle and fight. He gave them bitter experiences to make them stronger. And when you're in those bitter experiences, it's hard to have faith to trust God. But faith comes by seeing and hearing the word of God. And it's not by seeing things that are right before you, but it's hoping for. That's what faith, the Bible says, is. And here they were serving Pharaoh. Why would God, who blessed them so much, cause this in their lives? Because you see, God was building them to be a great nation. And as they grew and they grew, God was making them stronger by the persecution that they were experiencing. To be able to handle hard times that they would face as a new nation. That God was exploding them numerically. God brought them and is going to bring them out of Egypt. But he wants to bring them out as a strong nation. And sometimes that means God has to put them in the furnace. In order to temper them. And make them strong. There are times God puts you in the furnace like me. And we need that. So that we can be strong for the next thing. You know what is interesting in my life I learned? That as God put me through one thing. You don't sit there and go as a Christian. Well that's over now. Probably I can rest for a long time. No. He causes this to happen. And he causes that pressure to happen to build you for this next thing that he's bringing into your life so that you're stronger to handle this. And after he's done with this thing, he's building you stronger to be this and that you can be God's representative and not your own foolish self. He's building you. God was building these people so that after 40 years, they could be going into the land of Canaan and setting up a nation. But he was building them. For the promised land. In fact numerically. He made them a great nation. It's interesting. They came into Egypt. Into Goshen when Joseph was there. With 70 people. And when they left. After 400 years. Of the pressures. Of the slavery. 
They left with 600 fighting men. Over a million people left there. 600 men were galvanized strong men who had gone through tough times in slavery to fight. If you compare that to the American Revolution, do you realize that Washington only had 20,000 men? When D-Day took place in World War II, 156,000 forces landed on that beach in D-Day. And here God has prepared a 600,000 member troops to leave Egypt and strong and powerful men to be able to fight as they go into the new land. See, God did that for a purpose. God brings those things into our lives for his purpose. And God kept them in Goshen and, and kept them in Egypt because it kept them away from the influences of the world. They saw the gods that these folks did and they didn't want any part of them. He saw the kind of food that they ate and they didn't want that part. They were eating, the Egyptians were eating grass and, and all kinds of nice things. And the Jews were eating animals, food, steak. They couldn't grow stuff down in Goshen. It was a terrible land. But they had animals down there that they could eat. One of the tragedies that they didn't do is they didn't ask God to deliver them until Moses comes into the picture. You know, a lot of times we think we can handle things ourselves. That's where Israel was. They didn't ask God to deliver them. Not until Moses came along to relieve them of their bondage, to set them free. What a powerful message for us. And those blessings can become bitternesses, but God has a purpose in them. He was galvanizing them. He was developing them as a nation, as an army. And then look what this king does. In order to stop the growth. Verse 16, he says, and when you help the Hebrew women as they give birth. He's talking to the two women who were leaders of the midwives in, in, in Egypt for the Israelites. Watch as they deliver, and if it's a boy, kill him. And if it's a girl, let her live. Here, this Pharaoh wanted to have infanticide, a genocide of all the male children. And then their men can take the women and marry them and have more people that are Egyptians. But it's amazing. God provides two women who are civil disobedient and would rather do what God says than do what man says. These two midwives are named in the Bible. And you know what's interesting? This Pharaoh, they don't know who he is. The scholars who are trying to figure out what the name of this Pharaoh is, where these two women are named. Because they are willing to do what God wants and not what man does. Do you remember the words in chapter 5 of Acts? Where the apostles are told not to speak in the name of the Lord. And what do they do? That's what you say. But God told us to do it and we're going to do it. We have these two women. who are told to kill those boy babies. And look what the provision God provided for. These women were women of faith. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. And they allowed the boys to live. What a powerful example to us of how they stood against the power of even the government so that God's children can survive. The boys. Courage. Faith. And we have one boy who God has a real particular purpose for. A little boy. You know, God has that same point for each one of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 2, we're saved by grace. But not to just feel good about knowing we're going to heaven. 
Not to just feel good that our sins are forgiven. So that we can do God's work in the world. That he's planned before the foundation of the world for you, for me to do. Each one of us has that plan that God has set out for us to do. He's preparing you for that right now, for the next level. And will continue to do that as you go through life and the experiences of life. He will build you. And what we see with Moses. They were being faithful to God. Even though it was scary for them to have a baby. Amram and Jochebed decided to have a baby. Because babies are a wonderful thing and a blessing in God. And he already had a brother and sister. They could have stopped there. But no. They had a baby. They were not afraid. They trusted God. And isn't it hilarious what God does? You see, this child is no ordinary baby. But when she had no longer could hide him after she gives birth to him, Moses, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and Waterproofed it with tar and pitch. And she put the baby in a basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the river. She's trying to hide it so that it wouldn't be drowned by the people that were neighbors. Or would call the military to come and drown it. She was protecting her child. Jacobed, Moses' mother, was there. And so was Miriam. Miriam was keeping an eye out to see what was going to happen to this little basket with her brother in it. And lo and behold, what a surprise. Pharaoh's daughter is bathing in the river. <laughs> right there. And lo and behold, she hears this baby crying. And she sees it. She says, bring the baby here. And she falls in love with this baby. And Miriam, close by, runs up to her and her mother. And she says to Moses' mother, take the baby and nurse him for me. The princess told the baby's mother, and I will pay. She has a pay to take care of her own baby. Isn't this hilarious? And it's Pharaoh's own daughter who's having her paid to take care of Moses. What God does behind the scenes that we can't believe. And here he is doing this. And so the woman took her baby and nursed him. And she trained him. She taught him about God as she grew him up. She cared for him like a Hebrew child and taught him about God. Here Moses is getting the best of care from his mother. And she's getting paid for it. What a beautiful thing that God has done here. But then God even has a grander plan for Moses. <laughs> Look at what it says. Verse 10, later when the boy was older, the mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Isn't this amazing? That she adopts this child, Moses, and Moses is delivered and what does God lay out for him? To get the best education. The best knowledge of what government runs like. Because he's right under the Pharaoh's nose. He watches it. He gets a free ride to the University of Cairo. You see, they were the top of the line in Egypt at that time in that culture. They had all the mathematics. They had the engineering, they had the astronomy, all of it was going on. They had it at their fingertips in Egypt. And here Moses is getting all this ability paid for by the Egyptians. 
Why do you think he could write so well the five books of the Pentateuch? Because God planned for him to be educated well, and he was. Through the government, the hostile government of Egypt. And isn't it amazing how God can work in some of those situations? We don't even realize it sometimes. The other day I was in the bathroom washing my hands and a young man had just come and he was washing his hand and we started talking from the school. He's a junior in the high school and I said, well, how you doing? What were you doing today in school? He said, oh, I just got out of this class and we're going through Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place. He said, wow. He said, what a book that she was put in prison in this Stalin with his sister in this camp because her and her sister and her mother and father who were killed because they hid Jews during World War II. And he said, we just got done reading this thing. It was so cool. He said that they, her and her sister and the people in their barracks just were so frustrated because they had these bed bugs and they'd bite them in the middle of the night and all this kind of stuff. And they were just annoying. But she said they learned, he said that they learned that the reason why they could have Bible studies at night that were uninterrupted and prayer meetings because the soldiers didn't want to go into the barracks because they were afraid of getting the bugs. And so those little annoyances were God's protection so they could have the prayer meetings and the Bible studies and not be interrupted by the soldiers. He said that was just totally amazing. How God can use even little things like that and you see, here we see it. God is working through Moses and in Moses. And he's even using the enemy to provide for him. And then we see God's plan for Moses. You see, Moses, for 40 years, spent time in Egypt and making himself somebody really important. Getting the best education. And learning a lot and preparing him to even write the book of the Pentateuch. But then Moses had some flaws that God wanted to deal with also. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. And he saw how hard they were forced to work. And during his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. And after looking in the direction to make sure that no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Here God works with Moses who failed miserably, who murdered the man in his own anger as he saw what he was doing, beating his fellow Hebrew. And Moses is in trouble at this point. Because he breaks up two Hebrews fighting the following day. And they say, what are you going to do? Bury us in the sand like the Egyptian you did? And Moses realizes he's in trouble. In fact, look what it says. And the man replied, who appointed you to be prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. And Moses arrived in Midian and he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw the water and fill the water troughs for his father's sheep. Some of the shepherds came and chased them away. And so Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds and then he drew water 
for their flocks. You see, God used Moses even though he was flawed. He was a murderer now. But God used that to move him out of where he was. To this new place of Midian. Where he needed to be. One of the saddest things is that Moses had a temper. And Moses never dealt with it here. You know, sometimes God will bring things into our lives to make us deal with stuff. And he didn't deal with his temper. You know what the tragedy is about Moses? Later on in his ministry, when he's back and leading the children of Israel, his temper flares up again. And tragically, for Moses, because he hadn't dealt with dealing with his temper, it came out. And it cost him dearly. Because after God saw it and dealt with Moses, he said, now because of that, because you didn't trust me, you are going to lead these people over to the promised land. Forty years. But guess what? You're not going in. Here Moses was going to take 40 years of his life and lead these people through the, to the promised land. And he's not going to get in because his sin that he didn't deal with kept him out. What a lesson for us, folks. You see, sin is a place that sometimes is enjoyable. It's an occurrence that we do. And we find that that place where that sin is, if we don't deal with it and God's saying, deal with it now, we will cause us to deal with it later on. And the implications will be greater. You see, sin wants you to permanently dwell with it. Sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go, folks. Sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay where you are. And sin will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay for its sin. And here, our friend Moses didn't deal with that sin back when he murdered that Egyptian. In his anger. And even while he was in the wilderness for 40 years. And God preparing him for ministry. Of leaving this group of people called the Israelites. Over a million people. To the promised land. He didn't deal with that sin of anger. And it cost him dearly. You see when you flirt. With sin. It leads to a commitment that's hard to get out of. It leads to a bondage. And when you sense God is calling you to deal with that bondage, let him take it away. Confess it to him. Begin to take steps to battle that and to get victory over that sin. Because it's going to be very costly if you don't. In fact, it can become a burden to you, a heavy weight to carry. David said it so well in Psalm 32 when he was living in his sin and he didn't confess it. He tells how his bones even ached. And it can lead you to bitterness. That the satisfaction that you thought you would get out of it, it won't happen. In fact, it can take you down. I read an article about a man in Memphis who found a little baby rattlesnake who had just been hatched by its mother. He took it as his pet. This is the way sin works. And he loved to play with it. And he loved it. But he told one of his friends who worked in the animals at the zoo And that fellow said, you better get rid of that snake now. Because once that snake matures, 
It'll become who she really is. Oh, no. My little rattlesnake. When I call her, she comes. She loves to sliver all over me. He said, I'm telling you, when that snake matures, it will become who she really is. He didn't believe him. And one night he went home without any provocation. The snake had become mature and bit him. And they hadn't heard from him at work and they went on and had a check on him and they found him dead in bed. Bitten by the snake and poisoned to death. See, that's what sin does. It's very sneaky. It's very sly. And you see, Moses had that, and it cost him later on his life. But Moses, while he was 40 years in the desert now, dealing with sheep, God was teaching him and humbling him and preparing him to be a leader. And sheep, if you know anything about sheep, they're one of the most stupid animals. They, and they're very stubborn. And God was teaching him how he was going to deal with these stubborn people of the Israelites. And he was learning to be humbled. Here he was thinking he was all that everything was in the first 40 years of life. And now God is going to break him and humble him to make him a nobody. So that God can use him as a leader. And he does. God uses them powerfully. Sometimes we feel God is delaying in our lives. And sometimes we feel that he's unconcerned. Folks, he's not. He hears your groans. He hears your sorrows. He feels your pain. And he remembers his covenant with you. But remember, he has promises that he's going to mold you. And sometimes that needs to be, even each one of us need to be broken. Because he loves us. And is preparing us to be used for his glory. As he did with Moses. And to lead a nation out of slavery. To become a great nation. I want you to remember these words of the psalmist in Psalm 121.8. The Bible says about you and me as he brings us through all these things and prepares us. The Bible says the Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go both now and forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for being such a great God who loves us and wants us to get out of our patterns. A God who loves us and wants us to move forward. A God who wants to make us strong and stand for his purposes. We ask you, God, that we will continue to trust you no matter what we go through, no matter what you call us to deal with. And that we can be faithful and come out stronger as disciples of you, our King. And it's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Let's rise together and receive the benediction and close with our song. And now go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God your Father. And the power of the Holy Spirit be in your lives as you move forward in this life. Amen. New life in Christ, abundant and free. What glories rise, what glories is mine. What wondrous blessings I see. My past with its sin, the searchings and strife. Forever gone, there's a bright new dawn, for in Christ I have found new life.